Hello, I'm Derek Jones. I was always amazed by the ocean and fascinated by marine life. Being born near the ocean, the nearby shoreline was my playground as a young child. My home here on Cape Sable Island, Nova Scotia, Canada, is why I was amazed by the ocean. Each day was an adventure and I loved clam digging or fishing for pollock, sculpins, or mackerel at the local wharf. There were so many people, children and adults alike, it was hard to find a spot to catch mackerel at the local wharf. It was an amazing thrill to catch a big one and take it home for supper. I started my fishing career lobstering and hand lining with my grandfather Donald in the nearby bay, as we called it, near Cape Sable Island here. There were literally thousands of handline boats off Cape Table Island in the summer months. I also fished with my dad, Philip, on the Melody Rose, handlining for a few summers, and then on the Melody Rose with my brothers. Melody Rose was a 45 foot long liner. A long liner required the crew of five and we would spend weeks preparing the gear for the fishing season. We call long line gear trawl. And Summers, we would learn to bait trawl at the local wharfs after we got older. There were literally hundreds of children, older people, making the summer's work or even a living baiting trawl here in southwest Nova Scotia. The Georges Bank cod fishery was considered the greatest fishery in the world for abundance and diversity. Before going to sea, each crew member learned to bait gear at the wharf and then coil. And then out there we learned how to dress fish. As captain, my dad fished 18 to 25 tubs of trawl each day, weather permitting. The crew also baited trawl at sea and usually set gear at night. Then sometimes we had to stop hauling gear and all hands pitch in, dressing the fish down. The gear was usually hauled back in the morning with one crew tending the roller, another coiling the gear in tubs, another dressing the fish, while another iced the fish in the hold and baited more gear on deck. Long line fishing trips at George's 100 miles offshore lasted four to six days according to the weather in fishing. My dad eventually got his own boat, a 45 foot wooden longliner called the Five J's. 
Five G's was a fine vessel. The Five J's was built in Widgeport, Nova Scotia. Down a little bit of rolling, but she was a good sea boat. George's Bank was full of fishing boats, patrol boats, ships of all sizes. The boats were from Cape Island, Yarmouth, Widgeport, Shelburne, Clark's Harbor, Baccarat, Gunning Cove, all over. My father was known for catching very large, high-quality codfish in Hollywood. Some of the fish was as big as men, like we used to say. The five J's was often loaded down with over 55,000 pounds of cod that was to be processed as salt fish at Clark's Harbor. Waves often washed over the deck and when the boat, when the boat was loaded with fish. Sometimes it took 18 hours for a return voyage from George's bank because the boat was slowed by the load of cod. I was always curious about the unusual marine life that floated by came up on our hooks. While at sea, I was always fascinated by marine birds such as gulls, fulmers, jaggers, great skua, shearwaters, petrel, sunfish, sharks, whale sharks, porpoise, tuna, swordfish, all kinds of deep sea fishes, turbot, ratfish, unknown species of course. black bass, tuna kits, sea jellies. Trigger fish, queen trigger fish, encrusting bryzoans, sea grapes, crown of thorns, red tree coral, we called them trees back then, the fascinating squat lobster. We called them bugs, but they were actually a species of lobster. Basket stars, gooseneck barnacles, worms, slime sponge, bubblegum trees, sea spiders, spiny sea stars, bat stars, sun stars, 
vase sponge. Clusters of vase sponge. Cone sponge. Brid sponge. Finger sponge. Sea hair. Black coral. Barnacles. Barnacle clusters. And bald gooseneck barnacles. And sea fans. Cucumbers. Snail fur, sea fans, encrusting corals, other types of bugs, shrimp, egg clusters, snails. Anemone, strawberries, soft coral, hermit crabs, rock crabs, cup corals, acorn trees. Gold coral, stone coral, brain coral, and branching hydrozoids, dollar fish, file fish, clams, oysters. Mussels, strange and mutated lobsters, sea turtles, sea pins, to name a few. In April of 1983, I had a great epiphany when I encountered a baby sperm whale while fishing that inspired me to try to help the ocean. For decades, Canadians were warned that bottom trawling would eventually destroy the great Canadian ground fish stocks. In the late 1960s, Canada embarked on the complete industrialization and mechanization of the Canadian fisheries. The Ocean Commons was privatized by 1980. Bottom trawling is called dragging in Canada. The Canadian government spent billions of tax dollars to build a huge fleet of large modern draggers. Many giant fish processing factories were also built that operated year-round by the 1970s. Canada established a 200-mile economic fishing zone in 1976. The George's Bank hang, hag line dividing the fishing grounds between Canada and the U.S. was established in 1986.
trawlers of all size to fish George's bank. The dead baby fish go through the meshes of the nets and can be seen floating near the surface, near draggers. Dragging was considered to be ten times more efficient than the old style hook and line, long line, hand line fishing in Canada. There was no consideration for the natural marine ecosystems in Canada. Fish stocks were considered inexhaustible in both George's Bank and the Grand Banks off Newfoundland. Fish eventually become poor quality in Canada as trawling seriously damaged the quality as well as the size of the fish that were taken. The natural bottom contours could be seen on fish finding sonar in years past. Despite the territorial limit, giant foreign factory trawlers still fished in Canada, but for so-called unutilized species. Silver hake, redfish, etc. The other trawl doors, bobbins, and immense nets of factory trawlers weigh many tons. Draggers of all sizes drag the ocean bottom offshore in near shore year-round in Canada. Stern trawlers become popular in Canada in the early 70s. Steel construction also dominated the dragger fleet in the late 70s and 80s. Draggers become to dominate the local fishing wharfs in around Shelburne County. The drum on the draggers made them more efficient The dragger gear, especially the doors, clearly displays the unimaginable destruction done to the fragile marine bottom habitat and marine life. The hardened steel strike plates become worn from the contact with the ocean bottom and frequently needs to be replaced. The nets change foot gear and cable. The dragger gear require com constant repair and maintenance. Rock hoppers began to dominate, meaning they could drag any tight bottom. Even the net on a small dragger was the size of a football field wide. In Canada, scallop dredging is known as scallop dragging. 
This here is a video of a scallop dragger on George's Bank, Nova Scotia, in the 1980s. Video by Charlie Holmes, Cape Table Island, Nova Scotia. Scallop dragging is similar to fish dragging because both require contact with the living ocean bottom. Over a thousand scallop draggers scraped the bottom habitat in Canada for decades. Small, medium, to giant factory sized scallop draggers operate in Canada year round. Some lobster boats also gear up to go scallop dragging in the off season. Here on the wharfs on Cape Island, you can see that the gear comes in contact with the ocean bottom frequently to scoop the scallops that are laying on the ocean bottom. The big long device is called a boom. Scallop draggers use a single dredge, a double dredge or a dredge consisting of several smaller buckets to get between the rocks. The heavy steel buckets have hardened steel teeth with rubber lining. It is obvious that scallop dragon kills all the bottom dwelling marine life that it comes in contact with. The heavy steel scallop dragger gear often becomes twisted and broken, requiring constant repair. The teeth are attached to plates that are bolted onto the buckets. Clam dredges also dredge the ocean bottom habitat, similar to scallop dragging. This is strawberry coral that I found on the clam dragger at West Head, Nova Scotia. Very little of the non-target species called bycatch actually reaches the surface in scallop gear. The bycatch of scallop draggers, clam draggers include many plants and animals also damaging the bottom contours, vital to a healthy marine ecosystem. Very little video of scallop dragging exists, so one has to imagine the impact to the marine ecosystem. Here is coral in the dragger nets. Black coral, red sea coral, fish, squid, more coral. Here is a fish survey by the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans in the, near the hellhole, Nova Scotia.
lobster fishermen have accused scallop draggers for years of killing lobster as bycatch. The evidence is apparent, but still nothing is done in Canada. Evidence also indicates that bottom trawling and dredging completely destroys long lost shipwrecks. The Canadian bottom gillnet fishing sector has created a plague known as ghost nets. Countless thousands of ghost nets of all sizes indiscriminately kill many species of marine life and are obviously inhumane to me. Cod, flounder, unknown species are all killed every day in Canada by lost ghost nets. Nothing is done about it. Corals, mollusks, whales, turtles, the species are just endless. Coral can be seen coming back in gill nets. The disappearance of seven sea mounts, known as the Seven Shoals, is a decades old mystery in Nova Scotia. They appear on mats previously to 1955. Hello there. My name is Fred Gunsmoke Chatwin retired Canadian fisherman and today we're going to talk about uh, some of the things that went on in our fishery. Myself, I was a long line fisherman for many years hook and line, trawl on the bottom and we would uh, sometimes haul up pieces of coral not even knowing what we had but had no idea of uh, stuff like this was being towed over the bottom by Russian dragos this is what they call a bobbin. I guess one of 30 or 25 or 30 of these would be on their drag. Bigger ones in the middle. I can't even pick it up. And I, I was just saying if I tied this on behind my four wheeler and dragged it around my field and across my garden, what my field would look like after an hour. You can imagine 25, 30 of them. And this here is what they call a rock hopper. It's mostly some kind of a hard rubber. And it's unreal. We didn't realize that the coral, you can imagine the chance a, a, a piece of coral on bottom would have with something like this going over top of them. It went on for years and years and years. And like I said, we just didn't know. Kind of blind to it because it wasn't our type of fishery. but. Now I can see why we're, when you go out on George's Bank and around now in places where there used to be bunches and humps, they're no longer there. Well, they just didn't disappear on their own. Years and years of dragging these up and down over them hard spots and bunches is just wore them away to nothing. And that's solid rock, coral rock and stuff out there on George's Bank. So you can imagine what kind of a chance the coral stood when this type of stuff went over them, so I guess if anybody to blame for it is yourself for being kind of ignorant to it, not realizing what was happening. Now I guess it's uh, something that you look back on and say, well I guess I, I should have had a little more say or all of us should have had a little more say about what was happening, but it's like anything. When it's too late, that's when you open your eyes. You keep your eyes shut because you're doing your own kind of fishery, your own thing, you don't realize what else is going on out there, but now to look back on it, I wish things could have been different, controlled different.
I saved marine specimens as a teenager. And my first bit of activism come when a politician came to my high school in 1977. 1983, I began writing letters to politicians. I wrote about how the perceived damage to the fisheries would hurt our family, our communities, and coastal economy. And that commercial fisheries was related to the marine ecosystem. I warned that the economy would be destroyed and I suggested that hook and line was the solution. Then I wrote to the media that they were wrong when they said too many fishermen and not enough fish was to blame. I complained about the tax money to the corporate industrial fleet Continued taxpayer bailouts to the corporate sector was wrong. And I blamed politicians for ignoring the natural ecosystem. I wrote that the government scientists were wrong in that hook and line fishery would prevent the collapse that was coming. I was in featured in this article called Carpet Slipper Fisherman and it caused great hardship. I mean, very few people spoke about the fisheries, draggers in particular, because the immense power they had over top the government. I then wrote letters to David Suzuki and Paul Watson. Then I got letters back from the government years later saying that draggers actually helped the bottom. Maybe you can read here. So I returned my fishing certificate class two as a protest. And then July 1989, I was asked to embark on experimental fisheries aboard the Jenny and Doug, a 99-foot longliner to Trinidad. It was to be an exciting adventure to a tropical paradise. We were to target large grouper in the offshore areas. We were to train locals in deep sea longlining fishing. We made two 10 day trips, but we caught mostly sharks, moray eels, and only a few grouper. The people of Trinidad were fantastic and polite. As you can see, mostly dogfish. The two voyages that I made, two 10 day trips, we lost over 200 tubs of long line gear. This is video from Charlie Holmes. He went on the trip. We caught very few grouper. I believe that the fisheries reserves in offshore areas were destroyed by trawling. Here too there was evidence of peaks flattened on top. The groupers contained many horns. Some days we caught a moray eel on pretty well every hook.
The excitement was building, reaching land the first day. It was an exotic land. We didn't know what to expect. This was the first time away from home for most of the crew. A crew of 10 from Nova Scotia. The wharves were crammed with boats, foreign, mostly foreign boats from, from Taiwan, Japan, Southeast Asia. Many of the vessels were giant factory gill netters. I spent eight days in prison by a lich attack by a fellow crew member while I was asleep. I'm very grateful for my parents that sent money for a lawyer. I was lucky to have a friend that was a retired judge and forever grateful to Savrita Anthony that was staying at the same house. The repercussions from the Trinidad trip back home here was unimaginable. I was a subject of several CBC radio articles related to it, and I'd done many fisheries-related interviews with Matt Campbell for years after. I was forced to write apologies for what time was known as dragger bashing. I tried to focus my criticism on fishing technology, government policy, and not the people. I wrote letters, wrote articles, and done many interviews for the Atlantic Fisherman newspaper. I was a delegate at an international fisheries conference in Halifax and wrote many, many letters to the Chronicle Herald newspaper. I also wrote many letters and sent photos to the Southwestern newspaper in the mid-90s. I made protest signs for the huge fisheries demonstrations that were well received by the fellow protesters. By this time, the mid-90s, the fish stocks were severely damaged by the overfishing and destructive fishing. At the time, I was told by government scientists that there is no evidence and never ever will be any evidence that bottom trawling is bad. Despite my many threats from the dragger community, government, and the police, I continued to protest for the ocean and for the inshore fisheries. We begin with the charge that draggers destroy the ocean environment. How does a dragger destroy habitat? As you can see, the habitat is very delicate, fragile. That come off of the, the, the ocean bottom? Right. It takes generations for this to develop. And it takes a second for it to be destroyed. Precisely how, though, Derek? I mean, what, what, what breaks that off? Mainly the scouring done by the huge dragger doors chains, cables, rock hoppers. As, as, that dragger, as that dragger net is pulled across the bottom. Right. What, what's, part, why'd you bring these little fish? That goes to show you how desperate we are now to 
Well, what are they? Red fish. They're red fish caught by National Sea Products, used as lobster bait even too small for lobster bait. They're red fish caught for lobster bait by National Sea. How were they taken? By an otter trawl. Indiscriminate. You, you mean there's a trawl that, that where the mesh is so small it would catch a fish that size? Right. Yes, there is. They're used every day. Oh, oh, you. Grab your coffee cup there for a second. What's this? Wait a minute. What, what's this? What's this? No, no environmental damage. Right. No marks. There's nothing at the bottom. Is yeah. what? They're what? They're wiping out the culture of our province. The way of life living for so many people is based on non-destructive fishing methods. If you, if you, and, and you believe that your government is committed to doing that? Right. Do you share I mean, that? I can, you, I can provide plenty of proof that the ocean bottom is delicate, gill nets are destructive. They won't listen at all. You're born mm -hmm. here. Um, when did you go into the fishery? How old were you? I was 17, just out of high school. Your father fished? Father fished. His father fished. It's in our blood. Are you, are you fishing now? Well, not right at the moment, but I'll plan on going handlining later on, if we're allowed to go. What do you think is the future of your industry? Not good. Under the way, Crosby's men now. In probably three years, it'll be nothing but a rock pile and garbage dump out there, as far as I'm concerned. So he's got to act now to stop the destruction. And if you, if you were he, if you were John Crosby, what would you do? Have a self-sustaining, non-destructive fishery. What's that mean? Get rid of the draggers? Right. All of them? All of them. Trawlers, offshore, 65-footers, right, everybody, all of them. Right. The, the fish can be caught by non-destructive means, uh, ground fish. I had many letters published in a local Coast Guard newspaper. The blockade of a Russian factory trawler in Shelburne was the largest protest ever in our county, and it lasted several weeks. I'd walked it for, for out of five minutes until they took us serious. They're not taking us serious. I better the blockade of the factory trawling mothership gave me an opportunity to photograph the gear that was in published in the local newspaper. I received lots of compliments, but complaints related to my criticism of government policy. Getting a computer and hand scanner in the mid-1980s had a great impact on my work. Our fishing communities become fragmented by favoritism, quota share, and vessel size by the mid-1990s. Protest was everywhere. The inshore was shut out of our fisheries. I frequently responded to fisheries related articles in the media. I also assisted other community activists to write letters to the media and to government. I had many requests from the media at one point for interviews and to write detailed articles related to the fishing gear and the ocean habitat. Lynn Pace of the Coast Guard newspaper was wonderful in asking for evidence in fact. communities was literally a civil war related to the fisheries. 
the heads and head not. But what we see in the media was false. I spent hours and months and years working for the inshore fisheries with a focus being on the ocean, the natural habitat. I always tried to be present in court when other fisheries protesters were arrested. In the mid-1990s, fish quotas were bought and sold by people locally known as the Fish Mafia. There are people that benefit from what happened to our fisheries. In the mid-1990s, I began to collect, study, and photograph deep-sea coral trees, even though I saved some specimens as a teenager. Local fishermen sometimes saved the coral trees as curious lawn ornaments, and they were known to us at the time as petrified wood. I found hard coral trees, bubble gum trees, strawberry coral, stone coral, rain coral, and many other known species literally in the trash at the wharfs. I was always scolded and ridiculed by government fisheries scientists, fisheries officials that claim corals only live in warm tropical waters. I was told by leading government scientists that there was more chance that palm trees live in the Arctic and polar bears live in the tropics than coral live in Canada. I responded by saying not only do corals live in Canada, but 90% of all coral in the world live in the cold deep sea. Before Canada invented Tekler chains for the otter trawl gear, the Canadian Coast Guard had a program to trim trees out of St. John, New Brunswick, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, and St. John's, Newfoundland. In a spare room, I began to dry, preserve, polish, and mount coral trees. I gave some away as trinkets to my American relatives. I also traded fishermen polished pendants and earrings for coral specimens for a while. Fascinating material, just beautiful, gleaming. People really appreciate it. The corals lose their bright color when dried and would also disintegrate if not properly dried and preserved. Each coral tree had to be dried, varnished with several coats, and painted to resemble its lifelike color in some species. I hung the large coral trees to find the center of gravity and glued the base for it to stand alone. It took lots of hours of trial and error to properly mount, preserve, and to show these coral specimens. Thanks to David Humphrey and a few other local fishermen, I found some wonderful species. I also began to preserve marine specimens in jars of alcohol at this time. 
like sand fleas, tunicates, pearls of different types, crabs, sea lettuce, shrimp, minnows, worms, barnacles, remore fish, sea lice, monkfish, gunnels, toad crabs, squat lobster, bryzoans, coral spe specimens, cross sections, sea pins, a viper fish, a rat fish, a sea feathers, hermit crabs, sea stars, cucumbers, bugs, spiders, worms, a sea mouse, a tumor out of a haddock, face sponge, shannies, polyps, sponges, crown of thorns, lumpfish, sand shrimp, various collections of seashore life to show how diverse it was, egg cases, seaweed of kelp, worms, fish species such as haddock, ridfish, hagfish, file fish, silver hake, snail fur, brittle stars, mutated lobster claw, and a two-headed fish. It was all part of the collection that I started to amass for over a few periods of years. And then it was, I started to collect fossils. We threw them away as years. For years, we believed that they were exposed by the constant trawling of the heavy gear. I believe some of these fossils were 10 to 20 meters deep, buried under the sediment of the ocean floor, exposed by literally decades of bottom trawling, dragging the sediment away from these uh, fossils that were eventually broken up and dissolved by the seashore. Seawater, you can see the different bones, eggs, clams, and some that look like shark tooth. And you can even see smokers, black and white smokers, that was obviously tens of thousands, if not millions of years old, methane gas seeping from the, under the ground, deep under the sea floor, which they too were exposed by the dragging action. Literally millions of years old. I believe the holes were made from the methane gas seeping through the softer sediments. And I started to uh, preserve the coral specimens as best I could in my spare room upstairs in a friend's barn. I tried the strawberry corals. And I traded some jewelry for uh, specimens from the Greenland, Grand Banks in Newfoundland. bamboo corals from off of Cape Breton. Sea fans from Brown's Bank, just 50 miles from Cape Sable Island here. And a cup coral. And a blueberry bush. They were actually blue. The polyps would even move when they come into the water, but they dry, they turn white and brittle. Gold coral. Call it gold coral by the by the sediment, the the color that it would be on the trees. Firebush comes out of the water, they'd be bright red. 
They would live in the mud, anchored into the mud. Brain coral. I'm not sure the origins of this specimen, but other specimens we were known to come from off Nova Scotia. The red tree coral is the most common hard coral in Nova Scotia. Literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of square miles of red tree coral off the east coast of Canada. The acorn coral, I call it acorn trees because it looked like acorns stuck to the branches of a tree. That stone coral come from off no Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. That off Canzo, Nova Scotia. And I found it at the local wharf, discarded inside of a ghost net. Ghost nets were full of marine specimens that, that I collected. There were several species of Gorgonians. I call that the Great Gorgonian because of the massive size that they grew. I believe they grew over 15 meters tall, different than the common bubblegum tree coral that grows off Canada here. The colors were really vivid. Some of the colors of the Corals remained vivid even after they were dried. I was all, all, always fascinated by deep sea corals. In 1996, politicians in the local fishing industry made rules that only certified organization members were allowed to attend meetings. Several local activists and I formed the Canadian Ocean Habitat Protection Society, but we were still stopped at the door, and then fishing meetings become more secretive. One purpose of COPS was to educate the public about how fishing and petroleum technology affects the marine ecosystems the ecology of the ocean, draggers and coral, even the existence of the coral forest. And we believe these coral trees was tens of thousands of years old and were destroyed instantly by the bottom trawling gear. We made signs and we featured media articles that I'd written and had published. And the focus was in our area. The first COPS display was at Clark's Harbor, Nova Scotia, Canada. It was a phenomenal success. We had live fish. The children just loved it. They wanted to dive in. We entered a float in the parade. We had so many volunteers, they all wouldn't fit in a truck. And this is when I first publicly displayed the coral. The cop displays won several prizes and got the attention of local and national media, which also had displays in Barrington, Shelburne, Yarmouth, and then Halifax. The public really enjoyed discovering the secrets of the sea. Even though we all lived near the ocean, very few people knew anything at all about the ocean bottom habitat. I made sure I had a book there for the guests to sign. The Halifax Boat Show was a was totally exhausting. I mean, it was three days of just 
constant attention. And then we were asked to bring our displays to these public events from word of mouth. The display at the Fish Aid Music Festival was very well received. I began to tell people they asked how they could help. And I would make sure they understood by not consuming fish products, seafood from trawlers or bottom dredging. They could do their part. Demand that their fish was from hook and line, inshore hook and line. Then I was asked by the Shelburne County Museum to put together a dis permanent display. So I said, sure, no problem. The display from the depth of the ocean at the Shelburne County Mute Museum attracted people from all over Nova Scotia, Canada, and the USA. It was the most popular display at the museum at the time. My friends and relatives, we opened it to a ceremony that was very special to this neglected work in our community. I displayed the corals that I had mounted, the bubblegum trees, the red trees, a few other species. At this time, I also displayed fossils for the first time publicly. Many people never realized that we had coral or fossils. The common question was, are these corals from Florida? It was exclusively asked. You can see by the comments, letters after. It was a phenomenal response from the public. I was also asked to do lectures field for the field naturalists in a display at Clark's Harbor, a mini display at the same time. Clark's Harbor dis mini display had a, was very well received. The display at the Parlesboro Fossil Museum also was well received from the surprise visitors. They too asked the Museum staff, are these corals from Florida? Canada doesn't have corals, but we do. And they were from off Nova Scotia. The greatest response was from children and retired people. The, the, the People that used dragger technology would not attend, would not look at the coral. They see enough of it, they told me. But the retired fishermen that used dragger technology would, would offer their suggestions that the trawling had to be banned or it would destroy the ocean ecosystem.
I continued to have other displays at meetings in Halifax to show the people that, and, and locally as well, show the people that these corals do actually exist. Even though it's a phenomenal response from the public, it was an equally phenomenal response from the government and industry that wanted secrets of the industry kept secret. But I received thank yous from each display, heartfelt appreciation, wonderful response from each display. from people all over North America. At each school presentation, I started with a question, what is coral? I don't think anyone ever guessed that coral are animals that look like trees. I would go on to say the corals start as fertilized spores that morph into a polyp and then twigs and then a tree and then the types of coral hard, soft, rubber-like and then at the first school display a teacher asked for the names of the corals, and I would say bubble gum, acorn, etc. And she asked them, what are their names? And I said, do you mean the scientific names? She said, yes, I don't know, because I searched the internet and I found no information whatsoever on deep sea corals. All I would see is corals only exist in warm tropical waters. At each display, the students would ask, are these corals from Florida? I would say, no, they're from off Nova Scotia, right off our shore here. Each student had their favorite species. Each one wanted to take them home with them as well. They were genuinely fascinated at each school that I'd done a presentation at. And I began to share the photographs of the classes and that prompted more requests for more presentations at local schools. One time me and a friend drove to the Halifax to do a school presentation. They all would rush to pose to take their coral, a picture with the coral. Each, each class, elementary, high school, or university, really was equally fascinated. Then I, uh, contributed by providing coral specimens to schools for specialized projects. I made a video to send to different schools. Each school presentation I tried to bring as many specimens I could of different species. Some of these same species that you see I dragged around for years 
I made, I began to include fossils and jewelry at some of the displays. The students were equally fascinated by the fossils. I made presentations to elementary schools, high schools, universities, community groups, you name it. With a grant from the Fund for Wild Nature, I created a photo CD called Corals of Canada. A small uh, grant from Oceana, I created a traveling coral display consisting of two boxes. My cousin Albert and I built two wooden boxes that I put inside of traveling cases. I cut the foam to fit the wooden boxes inside I mounted the coral trees rigidly to the inside boxes with a glass face so that they could be seen. The project took literally hundreds of hours, but unfortunately was a failure as they become broken. I also had a request for a school presentation on ocean pollution. So I went to the wharf to, and there was plenty of ocean litter. You name it was there. Oil at the docks, plastic, litter everywhere. Little was known at the time that pollution kills a lot of marine life. The students and teachers were also very grateful, sending letters and sometimes making small donations. A thank you letter was all, was all I required. Obviously grateful and heartfelt. The great response from the traveling marine displays and the success of the From the Depths of the Ocean at the Shelburne County Museum prompted me to develop a stationary exhibit with a small grant from the Fund for Wild Nature and the use of an abandoned school in Barrington Passage, Nova Scotia. The dream of building a marine research and education center was coming true, even though on a very low, low budget. The project in Barrington soon evolved into a deep sea coral and fisheries museum. The promises of the local government also helped me develop this museum, even though they didn't keep their promises, unfortunately. But each visitor was greeted with the best deep sea coral specimens in the world, as far as I knew at the time. The preserved and mounted specimens included red tree coral, bubble gum trees, stone coral, gold coral, and others. My colleague Sanford Atwood at the time helped me uh, paint and build the shelves for this project.
each day before I came in. I visited the local wharves to find new specimens that were brought in by friends or just lying on the wharf, brought in as a curiosity. I mean, most fishermen at the time are fascinated by what comes up on the hooks. Some of the specimens weren't properly dried and you could still smell the ammonia odor coming from the specimens. Friends, family, scientists, teachers, lots of people dropped by. More people visited each day then visited all the other local museums combined. I was told by a local museum curator that came by one day. Every specimen that I collected over the years, I brought in for this display, hoping that it would lead to a permanent display or research center in our area to help the ocean. Locals brought in strange specimens to have them identified. By this time, there was lots of information on the internet you could find and identify these specimens. Also on display were marine fossils. They were very popular with children and older people alike. At one point, I too considered fossils garbage because they were so common. And it wasn't until years later I realized that, that they are valuable since the seawater dis dissolves them away to nothing. And this was the first chance I had to properly display my entire collection of preserved specimens. They too were very popular with the kids. And I had contests, activities, drawing and coloring materials for them. And their parents also remarked how, how interested. This is the first time they was being quiet. They were fascinated. And they left wonderful comments. It was the best they've ever seen. A learning experience. People would wow. They were really blown over by this. The, the 
joining fisheries museum include examples of gear technology, antique fishing gear, and related artifacts such as nets, types of fishing gear, sea turtles, swords from swordfish. I had four schools visit in September. It was a phenomenal response. There were so many questions, just couldn't keep up. Canadian coral is 10 to 100 times older than the same size tropical coral. A breakthrough in the acknowledgement of deep sea corals came by meeting Professor Martin Willison and Dr. Derek Davis in Halifax and Don McAllister from Ontario. I made two presentations at the Nova Scotia Museum to share my amateur research. It was nerve-wracking doing presentations in front of professional academic and government scientists. But dozens of academic scientists from Halifax in Europe and US immediately dedicated themselves to deep sea coral research. Also the Ecology Action Center was helpful in putting me in contact with these academic scientists. Research materials related to the deep sea corals was scarce, vague, and over 100 years old. Many Canadian coral species were still unknown or lost to science. The growth rings inside the coral exoskeleton indicate centuries and many centuries of growth. Each specimen was fascinating to examine to amateurs and professionals that like. For many years, COTS pro proposed fisheries, reserves, marine protected areas, and marine parks to government and industry. I shared my research, specimens, and time with as many scientists and interested professionals as I could. Another fisherman and I obtained an underwater camera from Ron Huber of Maine. We used a protective cage out of lobster trap wire to prevent damage from the strong tides in Rocky Bottom. We were told by government scientists that no video evidence exists of corals in Canada. But as immediately we were amazed by the incredible biodiversity and the vivid colors of, of bottom marine life. We recorded many hours of footage on VHS tape of sites we previously only imagined. The beauty of the sea bottom off Nova Scotia resembled that of Australia's Great Barrier Reef and off the coast of Florida. We made many discoveries ourselves. We saw mating corals, and we saw that these soft strawberry corals actually walked and could move along the bottom. 
We previously thought that they were stationary. We also saw other marine species interacting in their natural habitat. We also filmed corals at night with this camera. We also saw the interaction between lobsters and fish with these deep sea corals. Each time we watch the video, we can make new discoveries. We also took a news reporter out with us one day so she could see for herself that these corals actually do exist and you can get video. We waited till it was slack tide between the high and low before we put the camera down. Ron Huber was amazed at the success of this totally amateur adventure but it provided us photographs and video that we shared with others. In the meantime we participated as best we could with the academic community And the, I also collected coral specimens with another local fisherman in the Hellhole area, 100 miles off Nova Scotia. The coral specimens were to be used at McMaster University for climate studies. We used longline gear to hook coral fragments lying on the bottom, brought them to the surface, where each specimen was dated, tagged, photographed, and dried. An attempt to hopefully better understand climate in past times. Owen, a PhD student from Ontario, came all the way to Nova Scotia to pick up the dried specimens that we had in the engine room of the small fishing boat called DDS-45. The hot engine room was perfect to dry the specimens. Just on four tubs of trawl, we collected over a hundred specimens of several species of deep sea coral. Unfortunately, McMaster University refused to share the results of these studies with us since we are amateurs, but it was success just the same. And we first got interested in Canadian corals when we would see them on the wharves as children, ask the fishermen what they were, they would say trees. You know, they were really quite beautiful. As amateur scientists and professional fishermen, 
we decided to study these creatures on our own, photograph them, document them the best way we can, and then eventually we were asked to go to schools to show the children that Canada has corals. In particular, of course, the, uh, what really spurred us was the work of the Canadian Ocean Habitat Protection Society, the work that uh, Derek Jones was doing and, and Sanford Atwood. And, I mean, they had the specimens and they had them mount and, mounted and displayed. And in the fishing community, I must say that it's, uh, it's not a big secret, or it's not only one or two individuals who knows about these corals. Anybody who's been fishing on the edge of the Scotian Shelf uh, knows about them. If you talk to American fishermen, oh yeah, they'll say, oh yeah, I know those trees. So Much longer than manned submersibles might. Well, when we first got to the seafloor at 500 meters water depth, this is what we saw. The coral in the distance is about two meters high. It's called pink coral or paragorgia. Small coral in it here. And one of the few times we see some other associated sea anemones, and just up on the right of the screen, you see a cod. Uh, not something we commonly saw. Nestled in the, in the coral, just like the redfish have been doing throughout this entire video. The first deep sea Coral Symposium brought scientists from all over the world to Halifax, Nova Scotia. The long forgotten and ignored marine species were finally in the spotlight, thanks mainly to Professor Willison and the Ecology Action Center. The written proceeding included a chapter on COPS, reintroducing deep sea corals to the modern scientific community. It was an honor to meet and work with many scientists and naturalists along the way. Professor Willison also worked tirelessly for many years to advance marine science in Canada, and he focused on deep sea corals for years. Too bad I was unable to attend other deep sea coral symposiums that followed in later years. Letters from marine experts that discovered local corals through my work continued for many years. The common red tree coral was eventually identified as Primnoa recidiformis. Red tree coral, like all corals, absorb carbon dioxide in the ocean and produce oxygen as a byproduct. The black coral is known as Paramecia grandis. And the polyps can actually be seen in the underwater video from Dalhousie University. Acorn coral was recently classified as Paragorgia Johnson I. It was unidentified for the years that I publicly displayed it. It's pure white when it comes out of the water. The real name for bubblegum trees is Paragorgia. Arborea. Bubblegum coral is uh, the most common type of a uh, rubber like coral off of Canada. And you can see that coral decomposes when it's broken by trawling. It is eaten by worms and other organisms until it dissolves and crumbles. Usually with the help of friends, it was an honor to display coral specimens at scientific and marine cons conservation functions. I tried my best for many years to attend meetings for the ocean and the inshore fisheries like this WWF meeting 
in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It was an honor to contribute photos to a series of Canada, Hong Kong postage stamps. An unveiling ceremony was held at the historic building in Clark's Harbor, Nova Scotia, Canada. The town mayor, councillors, Canada Post people, and I unveiled the beautiful coral-themed postage stamps. Present were people from Shelburne, Halifax, Ottawa, as well as friends and family from my area. My dad, mother, sister, local postal workers, supporters, and all the guests were amazed by the mounted coral display. By now, they knew they weren't from Florida, but they were still fascinated by the specimens there. Most guests discovered local corals for the first time at the event. Signing the coral stamps that evening made me feel like a celebrity. The stamps were well designed from the photos that I submitted. I was then asked to loan a coral specimens for display at the post office in Shelburne, Nova Scotia. Most of the post office customers asked the staff, are these coral specimens from Florida? A wonderful article written by Michelle Bull then appeared in the Coast Guard newspaper. Cops was featured in the newspaper, radio, TV, and internet news many times over a six-year period. Nova Scotians who've had a rocky ride with traditional fisheries now believe they have found a possible clue to the dwindling stocks. Dead coral in all shapes and sizes and in brilliant tropical colors. This is why we had so many fish. Derek Jones was a fisherman. Now he's an environmentalist. That's because he's caught more dead coral than fish in the last two years, and he believes that's no coincidence. There's a direct relationship between the ground fish and the coral forest. The DFO admits they have done no research into Nova Scotia coral. Derek Jones thinks that's a mistake. Well, the end result will be a dead ocean. He says coral is still being destroyed and its importance to the ocean habitat isn't known. Ben Chen, CTV News, Cape Sable Island. Each media request was an honor and I always tried my best to defend the ocean and the small scale inshore fisheries. Willison readily admits he wouldn't know anything about Canadian coral if it weren't for these two fishermen, Sanford Atwood and Derek Jones. Well, we can find coral just a few meters from here, like some of the soft coral, or we call them strawberries. You know, they look like anemones, but they're actually a species of northern soft coral. And then out of little ways, you get little bamboo-type corals. In the little deeper water, you get brain corals, and then the sea fans, and then the hard corals. I mean, you got a wide variety of coral here. That's quite extraordinary specimen. Hook and line fishermen Atwood and Jones are so concerned, they've founded the Canadian Ocean Habitat Protection Society. 
They take their message and their display on the road every chance they get. They want everyone to know about Canadian coral. They want the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to protect coral areas from extensive fishing and gas and oil exploration until more is known about their role in the marine ecosystem. The internet made it easy to share my amateur research to journalists all over the world. I contributed to large and small newspapers and environmental publications as well. Constantly criticizing government and industry generated both good and bad attention. The bad attention eventually began to overshadow the good attention. I was unable to raise money with no tax number as a charity. Living in a community among people that operated bottom trawlers and dredges created a lot of paranoia in my life. The commercial fishing industry, I was considered a traitor for exposing the industry deepest and darkest secrets. People have always criticized fishing in the oil industry, but very few produced actual evidence. I dedicated many years of my life on this amateur marine research and conservation during this time. Eventually I wondered about the negative repercussions while doing each media article. Often I mentioned to journalists about the many threats I received from the fishing industry and government. I often felt proud and jealous at the same time when others were featured in the media regarding deep sea coral conservation. In the meantime, the science was building for the evidence of deep sea corals and their important to the marine ecosystem. Lots of people cared, but yet little, if anything, was being done. During this time, government and industry remained silent with regards to the damage done to deep sea corals off of the coast of Canada. So we done our part as inshore fishermen. On a fine day in August, Atwood heads out to sea from Clark's Harbor, Nova Scotia. He's going fishing, not with hooks, but with a camera. He's hunting for coral. Sanford Atwood thinks he knows where to find it. It's part of the fishing lore around here. His passengers today a unique alliance of fishers and university scientists with lots of questions. Oh, you, oh, you it's called strawberry bottom, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. People, people call it strawberry, strawberry bottom. And is there, anything, is there anything that you'd find in, on strawberry bottom? Like, is there anything that'd be good for, for fishing? Haddock. Yeah, it's really good for haddock, Really good. Really good. Crying bottom for haddock. Oh, well, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. They're doing what scientists and fishers rarely do. They're cooperating, working together to put an end to what they call deep sea clear cutting of an old growth forest. So we'll have uh, good quality video, digital yeah. images this time. Eric. Yes. Yeah, I got another piece of coral I pulled up this trap. Yes, I'm up here. Yep. Yeah. There's a big piece. Sanford's not alone in his crusade anymore. He's been joined by his friend Derek Jones another hook and line fisherman obsessed with corals. It's because they're so uh, much a part of the Canadian ocean. They're a foundation species that our ocean has relied on for years. 
and the knowledge of them is being lost. Yeah. Where'd you get it? Just a sail after Romy's Peak uh, on the other side of the cove. Derek Jones and Sanford Atwood put together a display of their corals, collected from the nets of draggers and off their own hooks. They travel to schools with it. And it attracts the attention of another kind of educator, Dalhousie University ecologist Martin Willison. I'd never heard of these deep-sea corals before, and I thought, well, this is a really strange thing. And I expected them to be little things. And I was completely shocked when I realized how big they were. At one point, the media was no longer skeptical about the existence of deep sea corals. But yet, privately, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and their government scientists always told me, like they have all along, that they are not allowed to tell the truth. I, I always tried to mention that I was told by government scientists that there was no more chance that there were corals in Canada than palm trees in the Arctic or polar bears in the tropics. I always told the media that the government tells me privately that there is no and will never ever be any evidence that bottom trawling is destructive. But eventually, the media was able to uh, search the internet for themselves to find information about deep sea coral and trawling. I'm grateful for the media attention and the article in the Canadian Geographic magazine. Very well done. Thank you, Canadian Geographic. After decades of writing to government, organizing like-minded citizens, writing to the media, and participating in conferences, the next step was to enter the political process. I joined a political party to help my colleague in the ultimate civilized protest in becoming a candidate in the Nova Scotia provincial election. My friend and fellow fisherman changed his mind shortly before the nomination meeting, so I decided to become the new Democratic candidate. I thought, why should Canadian politics be the exclusive domain of the rich and multinational corporations? The nomination campaign and aftermath was a surreal experience turning around in a spotlight to face the public made me see the world from another perspective. I learned more about politics in a month than I did in 20 years as an activist. With a tiny budget and help of some supporters, we made a lot of homemade election signs and some original campaign gimmicks. I lost but managed to triple the vote count for the party since the last election. However, I was eventually considered a radical by the media and the negative repercussions were tremendous. A few years later, I become a Green Party candidate at the request of a student from a past school presentation in Shelburne. At the time, seals become the scapegoat for the Canadian fisheries making the campaign quite hostile for me. As an amateur researcher, my conclusions to the mystery of the disappearance of the Seven Shoals was that they were toppled and buried 
or decades of bottom trawling. The evidence was obvious to me. I also realized that Canada's fishing grounds, deep sea coral concentrations, and petroleum reserves occupied the same area. The areas once worked by tens of thousands of small fishing boats are now fished by a few factory trawlers and developed for petroleum. Canada always proclaimed that it was the protection of the fish stocks that banned traditional hook and line fishing while bottom dragging continued. It was proven that the corporate approach to fisheries management failed to protect the ground fish stocks which continued to dwindle year after year. The arrest and prosecution of the most prominent inshore fishing activists took over five years and divided the industry. The failure to acknowledge nature in making Canada's fisheries resources manageable, the economy and the entire society of Eastern Canada. I always supported the inshore, even during court times. I'm very proud of my ocean conservation activities, but equally sad for our society and Canadian marine life. Although unable to affect government policy, I do acknowledge my contribution to marine science. I graciously accepted a recognition award from the Canadian Society of Zoologists at Wolfville in 2004. I accepted the award on behalf of my family, Professor Willison, and all those that supported my research. Even at this event, experienced and retired academics had to see and touch the corals for them, themselves to see if they were real. A story appeared in the Coast Guard newspaper regarding this event. My supportive parents also attended this event. I brought a small display to Wolfville on behalf of the scientists there. The encounter with the baby sperm whale was always on my mind, as well as the fact that I trained myself to be a trawler captain. Thank you for watching, contributing, and for having compassion for life in the ocean. Well, I left my home this morning to fish those lobsters off the sea. My lucky head is on my head. Don't
and fit. Ain't there a one when you make no good? Ain't there a one when you make no good? And there's enough to drive you nuts. There ain't there a one when you make no rock stars. I can't wait until the day is done. I love this life on the ocean, but I hate it when there ain't there a one. Well, I'm thinking about the main film. And what I'm gonna do I smoke another cigarette And I look back at the crew But they're looking in the wheelhouse Thinking what else can be done I turn away and then I say You know there ain't never one Cause I ain't never one when you make no rent Ain't never one when you make no rent Hey, you with the rain. 